The text I pray the Lord be pleased to speak to us from tonight is from the Gospel of John. Gospel of John chapter 15. Gospel of John chapter 15. We're going to read verses 1 through 10. This weekend I want to speak on the theme, Desperate Dependency, Living by Grace. Desperate Dependency, Living by Grace. I'll unpack that, these four sessions with you. But tonight's theme is Christianity's Parable. I want to speak on Christianity's Parable, and that's John chapter 15, verses 1 through 10. Let's read it. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, He takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, He prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father's glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. As the Father loved me, think of it, I also love you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. No doubt every true Christian here feels that we have room to grow. Every one of us that truly knows Jesus Christ, we would say with one voice, one accord, I have not just not arrived, I'm far from arriving yet. There's much more improvement as a follower of Christ. We all know that we're not like Jesus in every respect, and if the truth be told, we're very little like Him. Yet in one way, I want to suggest to you that that's very healthy. That's a very healthy attitude. Healthy because it promotes an absolute awareness of our need for the Spirit's help. It's the motivation for what I call desperate dependency. And basically desperate dependency is this principle you find from Genesis to Revelation. You will never depend upon God until you are first desperate. This is the way the human heart works. You'll never work around it. And it's the way God works with us. He brings us consistently to a place where human resources are insufficient. Education, learning, all the knowledge of theology and scholarship are insufficient. They are not all that's required. Certainly we're not against theology or knowledge or scholarship. We are to study to show ourselves approved, but these things alone are inadequate. They are flesh, and they are corruptible, apart from the power of God. Listen, Christianity always has been and always will be a supernatural relationship. Supernatural. It cannot be done in the power of of human ingenuity and might. It cannot be done collectively or individually in the power of human flesh. It can only be achieved by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so therefore, if you are to depend upon the power of the Holy Spirit, you must be to a place, come to a place 
where you know desperation. You need to be at your Red Sea. I want to ask you, have you been to the Red Sea yet? Some of us have to make more than one trip before we learn. It took many years for me to understand what I'm sharing with you tonight. But you know, a man can run in his head into a brick wall so many times and eventually he figures out the wall's not going to move. And that's what desperate dependency is. You never will depend upon God until you get desperate. Our problem is we're not desperate and therefore we truly do not depend like we think we do. And so, would you agree with me that if you had to take an inventory and analysis of your life tonight, you probably think as you're reading your Bible, why do not the things I'm reading happen to me? Have you ever asked that question? Why is what I'm reading not happening to me? Why is my experience of God so little in comparison to what the Bible says? Why am I so weak? And my desire for Christ. And why am I so weak in my power to overcome the desires of my flesh? Why is my zeal to testify of what I believe about His greatness so feeble? I'm talking about where we live. This is not, this is reality. And I, I want to give you the answers to these questions these three days. I want the Lord to lead us into what I believe is normal, the normal Christian experience on this side of heaven. Perfection is not the norm, but neither constant failure and frustration. The frustration and the failure you are experiencing repeatedly over and over and over again is not the norm. And you've got to quit believing that lie. It's not biblical truth. It's not New Testament Christianity. It is not what this book suggests or commands. And so a lot of what I'm going to say this week comes out of my own life, based upon the text, of course. But it's really a living testimony of trying to do God's will in the power and strength of Michael only to fail and fail and fail and fail again and again until God, waiting for me to get desperate so that I could depend upon Him. And I can't tell you what this passage means to me because it was so instrumental in helping me to see, now that I had been a Christian for even years, now pastoring, this time legitimately, <laughs> now as a true believer with the Spirit of God within me, this passage was to me a lifesaver. And what the Holy Spirit has worked in me as a result of this text, it's my go-to text. When I'm down, when I'm discouraged, when I have this sense that God has abandoned me and I can't find God, when my prayer life becomes just a sounding brass when the Word of God has nothing to say to me, this is where I run to. John's chapters 14, 15, 16, and 17. And so, this evening, I want to share an overview of this parable. That's all we're going to do tonight. I want to highlight its major points, its overall theme. And so that in the following hours of this retreat, we're going to go in depth and to its bountiful branches, we're going to feed from its fruit, I pray. And we will also go to other parts of Scripture that are in-depth commentaries on our Lord's teaching here in this 15th chapter of John in His most prized parable. Now this parable falls somewhere between the Last Supper and the Garden of Gethsemane. Chapters 14, 15, and 16, actually beginning with chapter 13, is the longest discourse of Jesus Christ. Second would be the Sermon on the Mount. This is the longest discourse. This is the longest passage of Christ just speaking through. And it's on purpose, I think. Its theme is many. There are many themes Jesus is dealing with. And they're interwoven and restated in different ways. But perhaps to me, and I think it is, 
the most important theme of this entire section of Scripture is the foretelling of the Holy Spirit's coming and His ministry. I think this is central to the four chapters and it's central to the understanding of the parable. Now why do I call this Christianity's parable? Well, it's simple. More than any other parable that Jesus taught explains Christianity. These ten verses is the very heartbeat of the Christian faith. It is the essence and nature of what it means to be a Christian and the Christian life. There is no greater illustration of it than right here in our text. This is not a Sunday only parable. It's an everyday parable. It's about every day of your life. This text should describe every day. Not just Sunday. Not just a few days here on the ranch. Now because it is a parable, there are a few things I need to say to warn us. When you come to interpret parables, you need to understand that there are some dangers. And you need to be on guard against those dangers. For example, trying to make every point of the parable have a doctrinal significance. That's not the purpose of parables. Parables are nothing more than sermon illustrations. That's all they are. They are means by which to help give understanding, like a window shedding the light. Illustrations are to be windows of the, for the understanding to grasp the doctrinal truth or theme that the speaker is giving. And they generally have one major theme. Some have a secondary, but there are few. Mainly one major truth is being taught. And so we must avoid, even with this parable, trying to wring the parable and wring out several doctrinal concepts. To do so would be violate what Jesus is using the illustration for. He's just illustrating a singular point. Every little jot and tittle and detail does not have major ramifications. And to allegorize a parable, that is, to try to find some kind of life application out of every point, is going to lead you further from the point that Jesus is illustrating. Now, let's look at the participants in this parable. Who are the participants? There are three. First... The vine is Jesus. Jesus is a participant in this parable. He begins, I am the true vine. Which is an interesting statement to those 11 apostles. You see, Judas is already gone. He's fulfilling his dastardly deed to betray the Lord. He's not there with them, which is a major thing to remember in a few moments. And so as he speaks to the eleven, and he says, I'm the true vine. No doubt, as they left the upper room and walked down to the Kindred walkway to the Garden of Gethsemane, there were vineyards lining the way. And he probably turned and said, I am the true vine. Significant to those eleven men, probably more than us sitting here, is because in the Old Testament, someone else was called the true vine. Who was that? Israel. For example, in Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, Isaiah 5, Israel is called the vine of God. Now let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My beloved, my well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up and cleared out its stones and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst and also made a vine wine press in it. So he expected it to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes, not good fruit. And then he identifies the vine in verse 7 of Isaiah 5. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. He looks for justice, but behold, oppression for righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. So... God in the Old Testament, which is God's storybook. The Old Testament is types and shadows and figures. 
pointing to Christ. So in the storybook of the Old Testament, God chose Israel like a vineyard and planted it in old Palestine, the land of promise. He cultivated it. He nurtured it. But instead of it producing good fruit, it produced bad fruit. It did not satisfy or fulfill the purpose God had intended. It was to be a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. But instead, it was just the opposite. It produced bad fruit. He produced nothing but good fruit. They wildly disobeyed and rebelled. Jesus explicitly and perfectly obeyed. Just the opposite. Jesus is the true vine. And then the second participant is the vine dresser. And here we know that this is God the Father. He's the vine dresser, the, the cultivator of the vineyard. And then thirdly, we see the branches. Who are the branches? Who do they represent? You. They represent you, the Christian. Christians are the branches. Again, John chapter 15, verse 5, I am the vine. And you are the branches. Now what is the function of each one of these participants? Let's look and see what the parable says. Each participant, what his role and function is. Let's look at the function of the vine dresser in verses 1 through 3. First of all, he is to attend to the vine. He's to attend to the vine. Think about what I'm saying. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. The word vine dresser simply means one who cultivates the vine. He nurtures and supports the vine so that it can produce fruit to its maximum. Which it can only mean this. Listen carefully. Jesus required the attention of the father. The vine dresser is to attend, cultivate, nurture, and support the vine so the vine can produce fruit to its maximum. We have gotten so hung up on the branches producing fruit that we have overlooked the fact that it's not the branches. It's the vine. As a man, the Son of Man needed the cultivation of the Father. As a man, He needed what the Father only could supply Him. We'll talk more about this in the morning. Jesus, fully God as if not man, fully man though as if not God. And the man Christ Jesus, our kinsman and redeemer, our high priest and mediator, our bone of our bone and flesh of our flesh, He was desperately dependent upon the Father. Yes. And He needed the Father's cultivation of His life in order that He might produce fruit. And so it is first of all, and mainly the vine dresser's function to tend to the vine. Which means, my dear friends, we require that also. Listen. Think with me. Don't just listen to a man. Think. Compare what I'm saying to what you know the Scripture says. We require it also. If Christ, if Christ required the attendance of the vine dresser, how much more are we? You, me. Beloved, in this, this, this outdoor space, we need Almighty God. We need an experience with Him. One of the problems I'm finding as I travel all over is that good Bible-believing people have their heads filled with a lot of facts and information about the God they profess to know. But they don't experience Him. Or if they do very little. I need God. I don't just need to know His dogma. I need Him. That's why He saved me. He didn't save me so that my name could be reserved in heaven only. 
He saved me because He knew I needed Him. I need His fellowship. That's what we were created for. The fellowship with God Almighty. You were made for that. You weren't made for heaven. You were made for God. We need the Father's attendance to us. He's the vine dresser. It's His labors that make the vineyard produce. And God must continually supply His hand. Otherwise, the life in the vine will deteriorate in the branches. The branches will not receive the life of the vine apart from the Father's hand. You need the life of Christ as much now as the day you were converted. Now listen to me, you who are not truly converted, who are wondering if you are. No, maybe you're not. There's not a man in this place who claims to be a real Christian who can live the Christian life. It's not just something we say. It's not a nice, trite little statement. It's a living reality. It's a reality to me. I can't do what I'm supposed to do here this weekend apart from God. You think my education is going to help me now? I can pass information from my brain to Michael's brain. Well, what good's that? Maybe if we're playing Bible trivia, it might help us. This is not a game. This is life. With life and death stakes. We need Jesus. The second function of the Father, the vine dresser, is to restore unfruitful branches. Look at verse 2. This is going to blow some of you away. Some of you may not agree with me. You're, you're entitled to be wrong. I won't blame that and hold that against you. I'll still love you. This is not an essential point of doctrine. Look at verse 2. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Normally this is interpreted by most to mean that if a branch in Jesus doesn't bear any fruit, there's no fruit, He cuts it off and discards it. But I don't think that's what it means. In fact, I'm sure that's not what it means. I think it's an unfortunate translation. Because the word takes away in our English Bibles is really one Greek word, "ario," And it can be translated take away or it can be translated lift up. Now before coming down here this today, I went through every time that word is found in the New Testament. And half the time, it is referring to something being separated, taken away, separation. But the other half of the time, it means to lift up, to bear up, to support. So now we've got a Greek word that we don't know how to interpret or translate it because it can mean one of two things. So what do you do? Well, a good student now looks at context. But if you're like me, you've never tried to grow a vineyard. Right? How much of, quote, viticulture do you know? That's what it's called, viticulture. What do you know about it? All I know is, you plant a grapevine and hopefully in the fall you can eat some grapes. There's a whole lot more to it than that. And so, I studied and I read, I studied and I read, and I studied, I researched, and I discovered something. That the way we do vineyards today, and you can drive down some places and see a vineyard, and you'll notice that they're on a trellis system. The branches are wired, tied to a trellis system. That was an invention of the Roman Empire. In first century Palestine, they were not doing it that way yet. They had just been introduced. The way Israel had planted vineyards and kept them for centuries was by planting the vine and then taking poles or sticks or even collection of rocks and propping up each branch that it would uh, that it would that they that the, the vine dresser would leave because you, you don't let all the branches grow. You trim it back, prune it to about four or five branches that you believe will be fruitful, and you prop them up on sticks or stones or rods. Well occasionally 
a branch wouldn't remain. It would fall down into the dirt. The fungus of the dirt would pass on to the, through the leaves and through the vine system and that branch would produce either deformed fruit, no fruit, could even disease the whole vine. And so the good vine dresser finding a, a limb into the ground, he knows it's not going to produce much fruit and so he lifts it up, washes it, cleanses it from any potential microbe that could have already begun it, the deterioration process. He would cleanse it and then prop it back up so that now it would be fruitful. I suggest to you that Jesus contextually, now that's historically, let me give you a context. Let's look at the time. When does Jesus give us this parable? The night of His arrest, the night of His betrayal. That's significant. Let me tell you why. He has just told one of the twelve that He's going to betray Him. And He is off to do that. He's told the remaining eleven that every one of them are, are going to forsake Him. One's even going to deny Him. Let me ask you, how fruitful were those eleven apostles on that night? How fruitful had they really been for the last three years? Come on, let's be honest. I know we revere them, we honor them, and we ought to. They were the first witnesses of the resurrection. We owe our salvation to them. We can trace your salvation all the way back to the testimony of the apostles. We thank God for their ministry that still functions. I remember some Mormons tried to infiltrate our youth. They actually, two Mormon witnesses came to our church. That's how brazen they were. And after the service, somebody came running in and said, Brother Pastor, you need to get out there. Those, those Mormons are trying to preach to our young people. And sure enough, there was a circle they had out there and they were just going at it. And I walked out there and they saw me and said, Oh, that was a good sermon today. We, we believed everything you said. No, you didn't. That's what I said to them. No, you didn't. <coughs> well, well, wait a minute. We believe that the church is corrupt. Don't, do, do you believe that? I said, yes, I, I do. Christendom is very corrupt. Then they said, well, we believe in apostles. Do you believe in apostles? I said, I sure do. Really? You believe that the ministry of apostles is still functioning today? I said, I sure do. When my church has a problem, we go see what the Apostle Paul says in the book of Corinth. <laughs> Corinthians, and he tells us what to do, and we obey because his ministry is still functioning. We thank God for these men, but let me ask you, how well did they do in the school of faith for three years? They flunked every test. They had to retake the test. The teacher was very patient and long-suffering. He even tells them that very night that you really don't love me because if you loved me, you'd be happy when I tell you I'm going to the Father. There had been very little fruit produced in these men. I think that's what this is referring to. Another role and function of the Father, according to the text, is to care for fruitful branches. Verse 2. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, He takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, He prunes that it may bear more fruit. In other words, God's activity in your life is to make sure that there is a vital connection between you and the vine. And He will be severely in love with you to make sure that the connection remains open. So any sucker, any growth, anything that would hinder fellowship and communion with Christ, He is going to be vicious. In an act of loving jealousy, He's coming for it. That's how much He loves you. Because He wants you to bear not just fruit, but as you see, more fruit. And then, fourthly and lastly, it is the job of the vine dresser to remove the dead. Look at verse 6. If anyone does not abide in me, he's cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. Now, again, I, I don't want to try to build doctrine and be tedious tonight, but I think this is really referring to men like Judas, not someone who is in an unfruitful state 
at this pre present moment. I think that's verse 2. In verse 2, he's very clear, every branch in me. But notice here, he says, if anyone does not abide in me, he's cast out as a branch, meaning he's not a branch, but like you would a branch that doesn't produce, he's removed. Now, again, I think this is referring to a different time of year in the cycle of growing grapes. It's now the spring of the year, the Passover. The farmers, the vineyard cultivators have gone through their vineyards. They've suckered, they've pruned. And you can look at the bottom of the plants and you'll see the refuse, the trimmings, the cuttings lying on the floor. They, they let them drop and deteriorate and feed the soil. But at the end of the harvest, after the harvest is over, is when the major branches, even the branches that's just produced fruit that season, they are all removed and they are, they are allowed to lie on the ground and wither and then the workers of the Master will come in and pick it all up, bundle it, and then they will cast those branches into the fire. I think he's referring to someone who's not in Christ, who may have said he was, a false convert, whatever you want to call, but I think that's what he's referring to. And that's the function of the vine dresser. Let's move to the function of the vine. Verses 4 and 5. Number 1. What's the first purpose of the vine? The vine is to produce fruit for the vine dresser. Jesus' function on this earth, and by the way still is, is to produce fruit for the Father. Those who are going to be at Grace Community, that will make more sense Sunday morning. The rest of you will just have to watch it, the video or get the audio. Jesus is still producing fruit for His Father. That's His function as a vine. For the Father. Not for Himself, but for the glory of His Father. Amen. Number two, He's to provide fruit producing life to the branches. Look at verse 4. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. So the vine is to provide the branches the life that is necessary for fruit to be produced. Because as Jesus says here in verse 5, the branch cannot bear fruit without the vine. And here's where we're not desperate and why we're not desperate. We don't believe that. Now listen, you can't fool me. I know. I've been a pastor, a preacher all my life. I know how ministry's done. I've watched it. I've watched it in good churches. We'll get together, we'll pray a little bit, and then we start strategizing, and then we'll throw a little more prayer on it, hoping that God will bless it. Why do we do that? Well, only one reason. You don't believe. You don't believe that without Jesus' power, supernatural power, you don't believe you can't do anything. You don't believe that. And that's why. Beloved, my cannot must join with His can. And together we will. Now that may sound like a humanistic statement, but it isn't. It's Bible. Your inability teams up with His ability and something happens. He's not going to do this for you. Your, your will must be involved. Somebody asks me, do you believe in free will? Yeah, I sure do. I believe every Christian has been given the will to either obey or disobey. If anybody's got free will, it's, the only, it's those who have been saved. You have a divine principle working within you, motivating you to obey, but you still have the remnants of this fallen human nature, the desires and appetites of the body and the mind that are wanting its way. But there is a way. Walk in the Spirit, and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But you choose. And then the function of the branches. Well, I just told you. You have to cooperate. 
And it's here in verses 4 through 5, 7 through 10 that the metaphor, the illustration, literally breaks down because truly in a grapevine, the branch bears no responsibility to remain connected to the vine. It doesn't get up this morning and say, do I want to remain here or not? You know, that's silly. It doesn't do that. So even in Jesus' illustrations, they're not always perfect and they don't always cover every contingency. It's again an illustration making a point, a singular point. But here, the responsibility of the branch is to bear fruit. In verse 2, bears fruit, he says. In verse 2, again, he says, more fruit. Verse 3, he says it again, more fruit. In verses 5 and 8, much fruit. That's what you're to do. You know what that means? It is the goal of the one who redeems you. That you not just produce fruit. Fruit production is not the goal. The goal is that there is an increase in fruit production over the lifetime. If you're still producing the amount you did 15 years ago, something's not right. It doesn't mean you're not a Christian. It means you're not vitally connected, living by desperate dependency upon God. That's what it means. And the way to do that is to abide. That's our responsibility, to abide. Now we'll define that tomorrow. So, put all this together. What is Jesus trying to illustrate? And I think it is this. I'm going to say it different ways. So hopefully you'll get it. I would say it's a discussion it's an illustration of the discussion of chapter 14 and an illustration of what he's going to say after the parable all the way through chapter 16. It's to illustrate interaction with Jesus. My goal this weekend is to show you how to walk with God. You say we already know how to walk with God. That's not been my experience as I've traveled. I had a suspicion as a pastor that even pastors don't know how to maintain fellowship with God because they've never been taught. They've gone to seminary, they've gotten their education, or they get called and they, they, they plant a church or they pastor, and, and no one disciples them and shows them how to walk with God and how to maintain that fellowship. And in my travels, I've discovered my premise and my suspicion is sadly true. I remember one pastor telling me, I've never heard these things in all of my Christian life. I knew I was supposed to read my Bible. I know I'm supposed to pray. I know I'm supposed to share my faith. I know I'm supposed to participate in the fellowship of the saints. But I've never heard what you're saying. But now I see it's, there, it's been there all along. And it is. And that's what Jesus is illustrating. He's not illustrating how to keep you saved. He's illustrating how to interact with He who has saved you. Interaction with Him. So let's go back to chapter 14 because this is the doctrinal theme He is illustrating. Verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in Me. There it is. He's establishing the fact of equality with the Father. You believe in God? Okay, now, with the same intensity that you've believed in God, Jehovah, Yahweh, wants you to believe in me now. Verse 2, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. Of course, you know what happens. Philip asks the question about the Father. Show us the Father. Jesus, I can just hear Him. I, I may miss this, but I can almost hear exasperation in His voice. How long? How long have I been with you? I said to you, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Verse 7, if you had known me, you would have known my Father. Do you hear that? You talk about fruitless or very little fruit. 
He's saying here, if you had known me. You really don't know me, guys. You've lived with me for three years. You've heard my teaching. You've seen my power, and yet you still don't know me. You still don't know. You have no idea. And they didn't, did they? They knew just enough to be regenerated. The Father's revelation had come to them, and they knew that He was the Messiah, but that's it. They didn't know Him. If you knew me, you would know that I am in the Father, and the Father's in me. Critical terminology. Don't read it too quickly. The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me. He's begging them. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Why? Why is he begging them to believe? To, after three years, to get the point finally. Because his relationship with the Father is exactly the relationship the apostles were going to have with Jesus once he returned to the Father. Jesus is saying, as I walk on this earth these three years, I can do nothing of myself. Exactly what he says about you, the branch. Listen to him in John chapter 5, verse 30. Listen, John chapter 5, verse 30. I can of myself do nothing. It's exactly what he said in John 15, 5. Apart from me, you can do nothing. No thing. Nothing means nothing. No thing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous, because I don't seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. I am in, I am in connection with the Father, and I interact with Him and He with me, so that I know what I am to do, His will. And He grants me the power to do that. I need the Father. There's the illustration. There's the example. Not illustration, a better word would be example. There's our example. And once again, what Jesus is doing, He's pulling back the curtain and He's letting the apostles see how He functioned those years they walked with Him and how they are now going to function with Him. Let's go back to the text, John chapter 14, verse 12. John 14, verse 12. Most assuredly I say to you, He who believes in Me. Now who are you believing in? The Father or the Son? Yes. Somebody said say yes. Which is it? The Father or the Son? The Son. I say to you, He who believes in Me. The works that I do, He will do also. And greater works than these He will do because, why? I go to My Father. Now they don't understand that. And you barely understand that. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. Who? Who's I? Jesus. Not the Father. Christ. Now I know we're Trinitarian and we know that they are equal in essence and substance, but that's not, this is not a lesson on the Trinity tonight. It's not what Jesus meant this to be. He wanted to explain how they were going to interact with Him and receive His life and power and how they could do what He called them to do. And what did He call them to do? To be His branches so that He could produce fruit for the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. The ultimate objective is the glorification of the Father. Just like it was for Christ. Nothing's changed. Nothing's changed in 2,000 years. The church's agenda is still the same. Now listen carefully. If you're not a Christian, you've got to get this. Your life has absolutely no meaning. I don't mean to be ugly, don't mean to be harsh, 
Don't mean to be mean. I'm loving you as best I know how. I want you to see that if your life is not lived to work with Christ to implement the will of the Father that the Father may be glorified, you have failed in the reason God made you. The purpose for which you were conceived in your mother's womb has gone undone and fulfilled. And that's the tragedy of a life lived without Christ. Is that you're going to live all of this time and one day then the truth comes and you'll understand it. And there's no more opportunity. It's wasted. It's gone. The purpose, the function of life, why your heart beats in your chest and your lungs heave with air is that God might be known. That you might know Him and fall in love with someone who loves you eternally more than you can understand or even experience. It's going to take forever to experience the breadth and the depth and the height and the breadth of His love. And then we won't get it all. And Jesus came. He came. He became one of us so that you could experience what sin severed. The detour of sin separating you from the life of fulfillment and purpose. I told you earlier, I wasn't going to be a hypocrite, so I was going to pursue the world and feed off of it and fill my heart with pleasure like no one had ever done. And the more I ate and drank of the pleasure of this world, the more unhappy I was. Why? Listen, man, I wasn't made for that. That's why. You put water in your gas tank, see what happens. It's not made to run that way. You are not made to run off the things of this world. You're made to function off of supernatural power. A power not of this world. A power that created this world and all things ever made. You were made to run off of that kind of energy. That's greater than angels. It's greater than any other power known to man. That's what you were made for. And that's what Jesus is saying. If you believe in me, the way the Father works in my life, I'm going to work in your life exactly the same way. So what Jesus is saying, if you ask anything, verse 14, if you ask, He says it again a second time, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Friends, I, I'm, I'm saddened. I'm saddened. I'm saddened because we have let a bunch of crazy people, charlatans, rob us of our godly heritage. We're so afraid somebody label us a charismatic, somebody labeling us one of those Pentecostal pew jumpers. We're afraid to believe God for supernatural life. The life of a Christian ought not to be ordinary. There's nothing ordinary about being a Christian. There's nothing mundane. And if your life is mundane, it's because you're not abiding. The supernatural life of Christ is not in you. It doesn't mean a miracle every day. It doesn't mean you'll ever see a miracle. But you will be fulfilling the purpose for which you made, and you were made to run off of an octane. Not of this world, but of heaven. And that's what God is offering you in Christ Jesus. But your sin. And what is sin? It's the same thing that happened in the garden with the first temptation and has been ever since. Your sin is that you do not want God. You hate Him and you want to be ruled by yourself. You want self-rule, self-will, self-glory. That's the problem. Because you believe the lie that you better than God know what's best for you. That's what He tempted Eve with. That's what He tempts every one of us with. That's the essence of any temptation. That you better than God knows what's best for you. How can that be so? What, tell me, what do you know? What do you know? Do you know how to split the atom? How many here knows how to split an atom? Let me see your hand. Guess what? God made the atom. You think you know more than God? Do you think you can see 
things happened before. How many of you knew this time last year, COVID-19 and a pandemic would hit this world like it has? How many of you knew that sitting here this time last year? God did. You're going to sit there and argue that you know better than God how to operate your life, my dear friend. That's the deceitfulness of sin. That's how deceitful it is. Jesus said, the only way is be tied into me and have interaction with me. And I'm going to show you how to do that, guys. That's what he's saying to these apostles in chapters 13, 14, 15, and 16. He works in and through us by the person of the Holy Spirit. Let's look at verse 16 of the 14th chapter. And I will pray the Father and He will give you another helper. Another helper. Another of the same kind, actually, literally. And the word is advocate. the same word that John uses in his first epistle. Chapter 2, verse 2. If any man sins, he has an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. I'm going to pray that He's going to give you another advocate, helper, paraclete, that He may abide with you forever, the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees Him nor knows Him. But you know Him, for He dwells with you and will be in you. Now friends, how was the Holy Spirit with them? He wasn't in them yet. Notice the terminology. He will be, future tense, He will be in you. Not yet in them. How was He therefore with them? Simple. The Father gave the Spirit of God to Christ without measure. He was in Jesus. They didn't need to have the Holy Spirit in them. They had God in flesh, man. Filled with the Holy Spirit without measure. They didn't need to be filled. But the day was going to come. And so He says in verse 18, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. But not, listen carefully, not bodily. He's not talking about the bodily appearance after the resurrection. He's talking about the person of the Holy Spirit. He's going to come to them in the person of the Spirit. For the Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. So the Spirit of Christ is also the Spirit of the Father. And the Spirit of the Father was in the Son. And the Son is now telling us that the Spirit of Christ, who is the Spirit of the Father, also is going to be in you same arrangement that he had with the Father. Look at chapter 16. He says it again, verse 5 and through 7. John 16, 5 through 7. But now I go away to him, the Father who sent me, and none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I've said these things to you, notice this, sorrow has filled your heart. They're sorrowful. They're heartbroken. They don't understand most of what he's saying. But just the idea that he's not going to be with them, because he's going back to the Father, they did understand that. It broke their hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Why were they so sorrowful? Why did they not see it? to their advantage that He go away. The same reason you don't. How many times have you said, I wish, oh, I just wish I could see Him like Peter, James, and John saw Him. Oh, I wish I could have been there and seen those things that He did. My faith would be so much stronger today. How many of you ever thought that? Prayed that? Oh God, if I could just see You, my faith would be exponentially more than it is tonight. See, you don't believe it's to your advantage either that He's gone away. Now why don't we see it to our advantage that Jesus has left and the Holy Spirit's now here? Why do we rather have Jesus bodily here than to have the Holy Spirit here? Because that's really what it all boils down to. We'd rather have Jesus bodily here with us than the Holy Spirit. The same reason the disciples did. They were self-centered, not Christ-centered. They were thinking about themselves. They were sorrowful because they had lived three years, given up so much for Him, so that one day they could rule and reign with Him on thrones 
in Israel, in Judea. They were thinking about themselves. And he's just crashed that dream. Now I've got to explain some things that's a little on the metaphysical side. It's not mystical. It's biblical. But you need to listen carefully. I know it's late. I'm feeling pretty good right now. <laughs> I'm awake. I don't know if you could tell. Okay. I'll do my best to keep you awake. But do you know that there's two components to reality? Two. Only two. There is the spiritual and there is the material. There's the physical and the material and the immaterial. There's two components. The spiritual realm is invisible. The writer to the Hebrews says everything made that is seen was made by those things which are not seen. The visible came out of the spiritual, in other words, the physical matter of this world and, it's, and this galaxy and the universe is supported by the spiritual. And by the way, God is spirit. And it takes those two components for you to really understand reality. If you're viewing things from simply the physical, the material realm, you only have half the picture. And physical senses do us very little good in the spiritual realm. That's why Paul says we walk by faith and not by sight. sight. Faith is the eyes of the Spirit. Faith is the spiritual organ by which we see and hear spiritual reality. Now why is this such a big deal? It's because we are addicted to the material. The apostles were addicted to the material realm. You see, all of our relationships in life are based upon the physical senses. I love when Sunday evening, when my wife picks me up from the airport, I know what's going to happen. She pulls up, and she's going to get out of the car with that big smile, and she's going to run up to me, and she's going to put her arms around me. I like that. I'm looking forward to that. One of the, and it's not a complaint, I'm not complaining, but one of the challenges for me, because I'm so close to my wife, she's my soul's twin, that's what I call her, is that I have to be away from her so much. I thank God for FaceTime. Although I've already checked, it doesn't look like there's much signal around here. <laughs> One time I told the Lord, I was really convicted that I had made my wife an idol. And I was arguing with God. Do you ever argue with God? I've already, I, I'm, I'm good at that. I don't win, but I'm good at doing it. And I said, Lord, yeah, I know. That's, probably, that's true. But I can see her. I can't see you. That was my argument. I can hear her tell me I love you. I can feel her arms. I don't feel your arms. I can look in her eyes and see the gleam in her eyes. I can't look into your eyes and see the gleam that you have for me. We're addicted to the physical. Even Helen Keller, who had no sight, had no hearing, she learned by touch the one sense that she still had remaining sense was the touch. And it opened up the whole world to her. And the rest is history. That's how we operate. Because we're physical beings. We are our material beings. But there's another problem these guys had. Not only were they addicted to the physical, they were lazy. Now again, I know I'll have to face them one day, and they may remind me of this accusation, but I think they would agree. They were simply lazy. What did these guys really have to do for three years? Jesus provided, supported, protected, and fed them. Think about it. No wonder their prayer lives stunk. They had God in the flesh. If they ever had a problem, they'd run to Jesus. And He solved it. How do you think they could drop the nets, leave their business? Do you think they let their wives and children starve to death? No. Jesus 
through His ministry and the gifts and alms that were given to Him, He dispersed to them and they could provide for their family. He took care of them. That's the way they made disciples anyway back then. The Jewish rabbi took in the disciple into his own home, clothed him, fed him, took care of him medically, everything he needed in order to teach him. That's what Jesus, he was just simply practicing the same form of discipleship. For three years, all they had to do is follow and listen and watch. And they had become so dependent upon the physical man, Christ Jesus. And like them, we depend on ourselves. And that's our, that's our default. That's, that's the go position. That's, that's just naturally what we are. But listen, even when you trust in you, you're still exercising faith. It's faith in you. And so the results of trying to live in the spiritual realm, which is where God is, God is spirit, and He's seeking those who will worship Him in spirit and truth. The result of trying to live in the spiritual realm by the physical senses, feel God, see God answer prayer, whatever, is that it always leads to unmet expectations, which will lead to disappointment, disillusionment, discouragement, the sense of abandonment, the sense of failure. How many of you have I just described? I was up in Oklahoma a few weeks ago and I got a phone call from a pastor who attended the meeting from another church and he said, would you mind helping me try to counsel a woman? And I found out she was disappointed and disillusioned with God because of something in her past that didn't go the way she wanted it to go. When you try to operate in the spiritual realm, with the physical senses, my dear friends, that's what it will always lead to. So what Jesus was saying, guys, you are addicted to your senses in experiencing God. And now I'm telling you, the physical senses will no longer be your experience. And that's to your advantage. And this was a huge paradigm shift for us. Some of us, have not yet made that paradigm shift. The disciples thought that Jesus was going to set up His kingdom on this earth, and in that case, He would always be there. They were going to rule and reign with Him. And so why did they have to pay attention to His lessons? I mean, when you study, listen, when you take in information, you take it in differently when you know you're going to be tested. You pay attention, you study, you try to do good, you try to learn the material. They didn't think they were going to be tested. Why? Because they would always have the king. They thought he was going to establish an earthly kingdom at that time. Even while he's getting ready to ascend back to the Father, what's the question they ask him? Father, is this, is, uh, Lord, is this the time you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They didn't think they would have to learn because they believed He'd always be there. And so when now He's saying, I'm leaving, panic sets in. Panic. Beloved, there has to be a weaning from the material. The Lord wants you to move from the material to the spiritual because that's to your advantage. There's a parallel between the disciples and us tonight. That's what I wanted you to see. They had to be weaned from the physical in order to imbibe the spiritual. Drink in, absorb the spiritual. And so Jesus took them through a 50-day withdrawal. They had 50 days of withdrawal, DTs. After the resurrection, He would appear to them physically a few times. That He did not dwell with them consistently like He had the three years prior. He would appear to them suddenly. One night on the upper room, the night of the resurrection, another time at the seashore having breakfast for them. He did not walk with them from this moment on. He says to them in these four chapters, I'm leaving tonight. It's over. Forty days and then ten days before the day of Pentecost. Beloved, Jesus' work is not finished. He continues to do His Father's will on this earth through you the branches. And the parable of the vine and the branches simply illustrate this new spiritual relationship. It's all it's illustrating. It's illustrating what Jesus lived 
as a man on this earth, and he's illustrating how you're going to live as a follower of Christ, a branch in him. That's what he's illustrating. Tomorrow, we'll unpack this more. I pray that this evening, God has started to stir something within you. How many of you would acknowledge tonight, I'm way too addicted to the physical. If I can't feel God, I feel like He's abandoned me. Boy, I know what that's like. I'll never forget when that, that lesson, my failure until that day, when God really showed me what faith does in the spiritual realm. Since then, I've never ever had to struggle with feeling abandoned. He's here with me right now. And I don't need to feel that physically in sensations. It's more real to me today than it's ever been in my life. And I don't feel it to the degree I did when I was first converted. It's better now than it was then. And God did a whole lot of things that you think, if I told you tonight, you'd think I'd lost my mind. You'd think I was one of those raving charismatics. That doesn't happen as much anymore. I don't need it to happen as much anymore. I've got something better. I do. And tomorrow and Saturday morning, with God's help, you need to pray for me because these are not our normal run-of-the-mill exercises of the mind. We don't think this way. We've not been taught to think this way, and yet here it is in the Scriptures. Here's what Jesus was trying to teach His apostles. But pray for you. Pray for me. And let's pray that God does manifest Himself here. That even in the physical realm, there will be the evidence of His presence among us as a result of us imbibing the spiritual life He has and is. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank You for helping tonight. You kept Your promise to me tonight. You told me in Your Word, Isaiah 41, You are my servant. I have called You. I have not cast You off. Fear not, for I will be with You. Be not dismayed, for I am Your God. I will strengthen You. Yea, I will help You. I will uphold You with my righteous right hand. You've been faithful to that, Father, and I thank You tonight. You are in this room with us. You're as much here as any of us are here. More so. Because we get our reality from you. Visit us these days. Transform these days and thereby transform us. You promised. You promised, Father, to conform us to the image of your Son. We hold you to that promise because we can't do that. We cannot transform ourselves. We have failed when we try every time. But we trust you. We're not here to regulate you. We're not here to even measure your performance. We just know that you have to do what you promised. So I am asking that these days will be Spirit-filled, Christ-glorifying, fruit-bearing days. Move upon us. Lord, we are living in precarious times, perilous times, said your Apostle. We need supernatural power. Our power is insufficient. We confess it tonight. We are inadequate. We believe You, Lord, even if we have to strain. We do know, apart from You, we can do nothing. 
Well, I've lived long enough, failed enough, Lord. I know, I know, I know, I know. But I also know what you can do when we desperately depend. Oh, God, save. I know you have spoken to someone tonight. And you so opened their eyes like you did mine 34 years ago. They heard this same thing before. Like I had preached the gospel before. But they heard it differently tonight. They heard it with new ears, new heart. God, I pray by your Spirit, bring them all the way through. Grant them, Lord, your love poured into their heart by the Holy Spirit. I ask this for your glory's sake, for the glory of the one who died for them. Blessed be the name of our God, now and forevermore. Amen. 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 Amen.